45 times Revelation refers to uh, throne or thrones, um, and um, only 15 times in the rest of the New Testament. 14 times in this one chapter the word throne appears, uh, and so we call Revelation the throne book of the Bible, and this is the chapter of the, of, of the throne here uh, in terms of, well, at least it's uh, uh, the number of times the word is mentioned and certainly the importance that uh, uh, is placed on this Again, John being taken up to heaven and into... Anybody want to see what heaven looks like and see what the throne of the Father... Well, here it is. Uh, and uh, quite, a, quite an opportunity. And uh, let's trust the Lord will make it a, a great study for us. Let's pray. Father, we do uh, rejoice at the, um, the number of men and women, children that came to faith in you during this last week. The, just the people that were encouraged uh, in their faith and from teaching from Danny and... Don Stewart to be able to uh, give reasons for for our faith and just the uh, inspirational messages we heard from so many others, including uh, General Boykin. And Lord, it's just been a, a great week uh, built up, Lord, internally, a little, a little tired physically, Lord. So uh, strengthen us, give us, uh, as Mark was praying earlier, just uh, ears to hear, minds to be able to receive what you'd have for us this morning in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's jump in. Verse 1, chapter 4, Revelation. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice, which I heard, was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like, and again we begin to get into the symbolic language it's you know god is not a stone but it's a description he is like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald around the throne were 24 thrones and on the thrones i saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads and from the throne proceeded lightnings thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal in the midst of the throne, and around the throne were the four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes uh, around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Let's go back to uh, uh, the first point we want to make, and that is the appearance uh, of God the Father is, is revealed. And uh, the first thing we note about that, the appearance of the throne is uh, through an open door. Now, we just sang a song about the door being opened in heaven. And uh, that's exactly what uh, John tells us happens to him here. Uh, now notice, again, uh, the chapter begins with the phrase, after this, that paragraph or sentence, uh, verse 1, ends with the same phrase, uh, after this. Now, back in, uh, in chapter 1, verse 19, we talked about that being the outline of the, of the book. Uh, there, uh, John is told, write the things which you have seen, which is the the glorified uh, Savior before him, and he gives a description. And the things which are the seven churches that exist right at that time that we've just completed our study, so we've already completed part one of Revelation and part two, and then the things which will take place again after this, Greek is metatauta. John uses at the beginning and says, now, after this, remember verse 19, ends the sentence with the same Greek word, metatalta, saying, here it is, now we're in the future. 
Now everything I'm about ready to tell you, I've told you what, what is right before me, the glorified Savior. I've told you what exists right now in terms of the condition of the seven churches of Asia Minor that are representative of all of those churches and churches throughout church history uh, in the church age. And now this is after that. It's, uh, it's in the future. So uh, a door is open for John so he's able to actually be transported into heaven and be able to see the throne of God the Father and be able to then be told the things that would be happen, happening uh, in, in the future. And certainly he, uh, he wants to make sure that we, uh, we understand this. Now, uh, one of the couple of the other things about this is we find that, that now that we hit this point, the church or churches are never mentioned again throughout the book of Revelation. And, uh, and again, our position is that it's, there's a reason for that, and it's consistent in Scripture. It's because the church age has ended uh, in the churches in heaven, because now we're going to begin to look ahead at what we refer to as the, the Great Tribulation. From this point on, the book will refer to as saints and brethren and children of Israel, uh, but no longer do we see the, the church uh, on planet Earth. The second thing about the appearance of the throne is the obvious it reveals the Father, the one who sits on the throne, is described. And, uh, and certainly, as one writer said, human words are inadequate, but they'll have to do <laughs> because uh, it's another, another completely dimension. And there's all kinds of you know, illustrations about this. It'd, it'd be like telling, trying to describe to your, your two-month-old two son there in his high chair how, really, how good a steak really tastes. You know, it's just kind of meaningless. They're not going to get it at this point. It's, uh, it's so far beyond our imagination and our comprehension to really know what it will be like, but yet here are the words that John uses to try to, to, try to do that. Now, we know it's God the Father because, uh, verse 8, it's Lord God Almighty, in verse 11, who created all things. John immediately is, uh, again, impacted or affected by his... Uh, by his appearance, which he says is like a jasper and a sardius uh, stone. And uh, uh, as I said, as I was reading that, God is not a, a stone, but uh, we get this symbolic language. He is like, and he tries to de uh, describe the best he can. Now, uh, uh, a jasper stone, uh, most commentators believe would be the equivalent, not that it would be the same, but be equivalent to a diamond. Uh, and we base that on uh, we have the phrase mentioned later in chapter 21 and verse 10, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So whether it's a diamond or not, it's the jasper stone, again, trying to put in human words, looking at, at God the Father in terms of sitting on his throne, uh, and the first thing he says is that the best I can, I can say is that, and again, God is spirit, uh, is described as light, and there's a light emanating as if, and again, if you take a, uh, a really good diamond and shine a light through it, you're going to have it basically hit the color, uh, the color spectrum, uh, and uh, he's doing the best he can to describe this. Now, there's a couple of things about these stones uh, symbolically as well that I think are important. We'll look at in a moment. But uh, jasper, like, uh, like clear as crystal. And then the uh, Sardius stone is uh, named after the city of Sardis, one of our churches in Asia Minor, which had, was known for its beautiful red stones. And again, most people would say the color of this, most commentators, is a blood or a ruby red. We find the same color used in chapter 6, same words used, and a horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Uh, if, if that's intentional, this color choice and color use, then uh, that first stone, uh, the jasper stone, clear as crystal, uh, in terms of its purity, but certainly represent to us the holiness of God. And if the red stone, in terms of its brilliance and this deep, dark red color that we see appear again later, really speaks of God's justice, is going to be, to be met out. Uh, and um, 
Very interesting, a couple of the other things that we find because these stones appear in the Old Testament. We've talked about many times that the book of Revelation really is a journey back to the future. We really have to go back to the Old Testament constantly in order to understand what's being said about the future. And these two stones are, are mentioned very interesting uh, in Exodus 28. So if they already speak to us of God's justice and his holiness, uh, notice this. Uh, there it says, and you shall, speaking of the high priest in his priestly garments and his breastplate in particular that have stones on it, as you recall, and you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stone. The first row shall be, and the first stone is sardius, the stone that we're talking about here. And then it goes on and mentions the topaz and emerald. This shall, uh, there, this shall be the first row. The second row shall be turquoise, sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a Jaseth, an agate, an amethyst, and the fourth road, a beryl, an onyx, and the last stone, uh, a jasper. So the first stone in the priestly garment, the last stone in the priestly garment in this breastplate uh, really speak of, uh, of, of these stones. John now trying to describe God the Father. In terms of, uh, I think, without stretching it too far, uh, just to go one step further, remember each of these stones represented a tribe. And uh, that first stone, Sardius, represents the tribe of Reuben. Uh, Reuben in Hebrew means, behold, a son. This gets interesting. The jasper rep represent, represents Benjamin or Benjamin, and it means son of my right, right hand. So the two stones that John sees, would John know this? He's Jewish. He knows this, right? I mean, he's going, that's like on the priestly garment. That is the same color representing what would be, in our term, terminology, the incarnation, where God the Father says, Behold the Son. Jesus comes and he is incarnated. Uh, and now, Son of my right hand, the exaltation of the Son uh, as well. I, I, and again, if you can say with me, I think that about everything that we see in heaven is going to speak to us about some aspect of our redemption, our relationship with Jesus Christ, what he's done for us. I think everything there will just cause us to, uh, uh, in a greater dimension, love the Lord, worship the Lord. Everything that we might value here just, you know, uh, increases exponentially up there. Uh, but again, Jesus Christ, certainly it is incarnation is the fulfillment of behold the Son. Uh, in the son of my right hand in terms of his uh, exaltation. The writer of Hebrews says that the son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. His, again, his exaltation, his death, his resurrection, and then he was exalted sitting at the right hand of the father. The two stones that John sees reminds him of what's on the breastplate, and he would fully understand which tribe and what those words uh, meant. In terms of uh, uh, the rainbow that's around it, and again, all of this is to speak of God's transcendent glory, uh, why a rainbow? Well, uh, I think that's, that's fairly obvious, but again, it's, not, it's an emerald rainbow. It's not exactly like the rainbow that we see in the sky, but when we see the rainbow, Genesis 9.13, I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me uh, and the earth. So every time the, the rainbow is there, it's, it's a reminder to us, it should be a reminder to us that God is faithful. That's a sign of the covenant. And God kept his word, and God always keeps his word. And that, too, is a, a very Jewish concept. Let me just read a little bit from, uh, from Psalm 89. And, and we could go right through the thing. The whole psalm is about the faithfulness of God. And it mentions this idea of the sign in the sky uh, and how it's tied to God's faithfulness. And that's to be to the reminder. But just to jump all the way down to verse 33. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will not utterly take from him nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. The faithful witness in the sky is the rainbow. 
So here around God's throne, John's doing the best that he possibly can. And first the thing he says is he sees God the Father on the throne. He, the best he can do is describe him as like light emanating from a diamond, from a blood red jasper. And both of those things have meaning to him uh, in terms of a Jewish context. And I think it will be for us as well. We'll look at God the Father and we'll see that he is holy. He is just and he is loving because he sent his son to die for our sins. And his son is now exalted at the right hand. And around that, and God is faithful and he always kept his word to me. I think that'll be at least a glimmer of our experience when, we're, when we see this uh, for ourselves in uh, in heaven. The other thing about the appearance, the third thing, it included what was heard. Notice there's a voice in heaven, which uh, refers back to chapter one. I will show you things which must take place. Uh, he describes it as, as I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet, and the voice in chapter one already identified as, as the voice of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't want to discourage anyone here this morning, but um, uh, with maybe without a show of hands, how many thought the music was a little too loud when Volta was playing? I think there might have been a few people. Well, I hate to shock you. It's going to be a lot louder in heaven. When, when Jesus speaks, it's like a trumpet in your ear. You ever had somebody come up and <clears throat> take a trumpet? Kind of a fun thing to do if somebody's sleeping <clears throat> and you blast them in the ear. That's what the voice is, is like. It's a loud voice. No. Praise God, we're going to have different hearing abilities once, once we're there. I appreciate the loud thing. <clears throat> My hearing's getting worse, so it's, it's okay if it gets a little, little louder. I'm, I'm okay with that. But uh, heaven's going to be a loud place. Uh, and so there's going to, he's hearing the voice of, uh, of Jesus. <clears throat> he's also hearing what appears to be thundering and voices. And, and again, all of that is uh, language that would bring to mind, as we'll see uh, in our uh, subsequent studies, judgment. So there's, there's this uh, transcendent glory and things that speak to us of what John is seeing of God's holiness, his purity, his faithfulness, his love. But there's this, this thing of judgment, though, that's, that's coming. And, uh, and I think John would have probably got that. Uh, the appearance of the throne also revealed the seven spirits of God, and we've already identified and spent some time on them and some, a couple of different views, but tried to make a very, I thought, a very good case for the fact that these are just the seven angels that are before the throne of God that are there to do his, his bidding. Later, we'll see them in chapter 8, verse 2, and they, John will say, I saw the seven angels who stand before God. They are there, and and again, in the <clears throat> orchestration of, of the heavenly beings, we're, we're, we're being introduced to some uh, rankings of, of angels. There are those seraphim or cherubim that are <clears throat> right around the throne of God. There's these seven that are there waiting to do his bidding. We're going to see that some of them are more important and some, in fact, actually lead the, the worship in heaven. <clears throat> the appearance of the throne also reveals the, the sea of glass. Now, if you want to turn over to chapter 15, we have another mention of the sea of glass there. We want to make a few comments about it and then, and then, um, and then tie it in again with something that we see in the Old Testament as well. But chapter 15, verse 1, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like, and again, symbolic language, like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps, the, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Apparently, tribulation saints that are there, standing on the sea of glass. Ancient Ancient kings, ancient monarchs, whether it's the Pharaoh or anybody else that we find in, in, uh, in ancient literature, very interesting to, and we know a lot about their throne rooms and, and what they look like and so forth. And one of the things that is indicative to all of them is that from the throne going down, there was a place right before them, uh, a lot of times in, in marble or some other precious stone, it was a space from which there was a separation between them and the people. 
Somebody that appeared before the king could not come any further. They might be able to enter that formal courtroom, take a position that was theirs and so forth, but they could not come any, any closer on that area right out in front of them. You're familiar with the story of Esther who wanted to approach her husband, the king, but could not come any forward to this area right in front of the throne unless he gave permission by extending the scepter. Anybody that approached without that permission would actually be, be executed. So here's the throne of God. And, and, and before his throne is something that appears to be like a sea of glass. But we find later the tribulation saints are able to stand on it. Again, indicating that God is separate. He is holy. He is completely other in terms of God the Father. And before him, rightly so, there is this area. But at the same time, we have, we have the saints being able to bridge that gap in a sense and come on the sea of glass and come closer and come into his, uh, his very uh, presence. Now, again, in the Old Testament, I think that there's an equivalent in terms of the bronze laver or the, what would appear to be a, a small sea of glass. It was pretty huge, and it was used by the priests. Before they made their approach to God, they would have to ceremonially cleanse themselves in it before they even went in to offer a sacrifice. And again, it spoke of the separation, the holiness of God, <clears throat> and the fact that their, uh, their own lives needed to be cleansed and, uh, before they could approach God. In heaven, at the throne of the Father is a sea of glass that we'll be able to approach on. And, uh, but I think when we do, it's going to remind us of the fact that of His holiness, which means He is completely other. He is completely different. He is nothing like us in any way. And we really can't approach him other than what he has done for us. He has, in a sense, lowered the scepter so we can come forward uh, through the sacrifice of his son. Uh, I just think there's going to be so many things in heaven that are like this that remind us of his faithfulness, his holiness, his love, his mercy, uh, and, his, uh, and his grace. Secondly, we have the elders that are already at the throne. And that's in verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their, on their heads. So the 24 elders are, are seated there. The number of the 24 is, uh, uh, is used only one other time in the Bible, and it's to describe, remember, David when he set to establish the, the, the temple there in Jerusalem. He was not going to be able to build it himself, but he set aside through his own personal wealth and, uh, and so forth, everything that was needed so his son could build it. And he had already developed the Psalms and all the worship. He took all the priests and he divided them up into 24 divisions or courses and had a schedule for them so they could come and serve two weeks out of the year. They would be there. And of course, those priests, as well as the singers and musicians were divided up into 24 courses or divisions as well. So when they are there and they are ministering, they're representative of all of them. And those priests are representative of all of the people. They're representing God, uh, representing the people before God. So the 24 elders is a, is a number that speaks to us of they are representative of another uh, entire group, a very specific group. Uh, and so secondly, who are they? Well, the elders are described as overcomers. We've, we've just been looking at uh, the seven churches. Notice they wear white robes. They have crowns of gold on their head. Uh, and that describes uh, exactly the uh, word that's used for crown is... Uh, Stephanus, it's the same word that's used of those crowns given to the overcomers uh, of the church age. It's not the same as a crown of, uh, of royalty. So again, my, it's, uh, you know, our position is that uh, this group, these elders represent an entire group, overcomers, believers, the church age believers that have already placed their faith in Jesus Christ and were with the Lord uh, in heaven prior to the tribulation, and that is the Third thing, the uh, theological uh, implication. Some would say that, um, well, maybe they're representative of Israel. <laughs> Israel's still on the earth. 
right? I mean, uh, uh, a third of the, the Jews on the earth are, are going to be spared. Uh, they're the ones that cry out to Jesus and receive him as their Messiah. They will look on the one they have pierced and mourn for one as they mourn for an only son. You've got the 144,000 Jews that are sealed by God during the tribulation uh, that go out and preach the gospel around the world. <clears throat> These cannot be uh, representative of the Israel, but they are representative of an, of an entire group uh, and the only group that they really fit because of their description is the, uh, is the church age uh, believers, which uh, is what we're going to see as we, uh, as we go through the book of uh, Revelation. Again, we don't want to develop our theology and then find verses in the Bible to substantiate our theology. We want our theology to conform to what we actually find in the Bible. And so as we've gone through the epistles in different places, we find that the church age believers, us, <laughs> are, are raptured or with the Lord prior to the tribulation. And as we go and we look at the tribulation in our study here, it won't only be here. We're going to find that consistent as well. Uh, the only other group they could be, some would say that, well, they're the tribulation saints. And uh, people that hold another view like to say that, but that kind of gets shot down in chapter 7. Uh, there it says in verse 11, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders of the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. You notice there's a lot of this going on in heaven up there. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, who are these arrayed? Who said? Then one of the elders answered to me saying, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So you've already got the, the elders there representing the church aged believers when the tribulation saints show up. Who are those guys? Well, they're, they're the tribulation saints, but the elders representing the church is already in heaven. So again, there's only so many groups of people. It can't be the tribulation saints. It can't be Israel. It's got to be somebody that's saved. You know, it's, it's the church aid believers that are there. And um, that should be a great blessing in, the, in and of itself, especially as we start studying what the tribulation is going to be like. This is very interesting studying this. I'm glad we're not here, is what uh, you'll say to yourself over and over again. The third thing, the four living creatures around the throne are described, and that's in verse 7 and 8. The first living creature was like a lion. The second, like a living creature, like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. I know some of you are saying, you just described my neighbors. You mean there's people like that in heaven as well? But uh, yes, there is. The four living creatures, each having six wings, full of eyes are around with them. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. So the living creatures are described. And, and they are mentioned in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 10.20, again, identifying them there as well. Uh, they are mentioned several times in Revelation, in chapter 4, chapter 5, uh, a couple of times in chapter 5. Uh, and we could say, in a sense, they represent uh, all of the angels, but certainly these have a very distinct um, uh, look to them, uh, the first like a lion, then a calf like a man, and a flying eagle. So what's up with that? You know, what are, what, and again, it's like, this is some symbolic language being used of these uh, angelic beings who, who are very unique because it says they are not just at the throne, they are in the midst of, and that's where they, they remain. And we'll also see that when they say something and begin to worship, everybody else does too. So literally, these are the, the worship leaders in, in heaven. Very powerful, very unique, and uh, very interesting uh, characteristics. Uh, just to give you four, four views of this, because uh, we don't have a, even though these, they're consistently mentioned to describe this way, we don't have a, a, a great description. There, there's a couple that are very interesting. One is that the angels have the characteristics of, of the four. Uh, the characteristics of whatever you might want to describe in terms of the eagle and, and uh, make some kind of uh, guess as to 
attributes that they might have. Some say they picture Jesus Christ as seen in the, uh, in the four Gospels, you know, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and John. And there's a lot of uh, church uh, artwork that depict the four Gospels in, uh, in this very, uh, very way. Uh, and then uh, some would say they illustrate the attributes of God, his majesty, his strength, his intelligence, uh, his sovereignty. Uh, those two are, are a little difficult to make a case for. Uh, but also, the, again, in more of a Jewish setting, they remind us forth of Israel's encampment around the, <clears throat> the tabernacle. Now, you remember when they were, were traveling in the wilderness wandering, when Moses gets the Ten Commandments, they would be encamped. Uh, the tabernacle would be in the middle. I don't know if you've ever seen any, uh, uh, seen any some of the satellite photos that we have of that, but uh, some of the pictures of that. But you have God's Shekinah glory right there. Everything is very organized. You have so many tribes camped on the, the, the north, the south, the east, and the west, and, and so forth, described in, in great detail. Uh, their tents were pitched in the order of Judah being first. Judah was, of course, represented by the, the lion. And that's our, our first characteristic. Um, on the first of three sides, uh, the next group as it began would be Ephraim. Ephraim described, again, uh, or aligned to the idea of an ox. That fits our picture. Reuben would be the next group coming down, beginning, uh, depicted as a man. And then the last group on the other side, again, there's four tribes on each side, but the first one being Dan, uh, again, interesting, again, that uh, his little icon logo would be that, that of, uh, of a logo. Uh, don't want to make too much of these things, but if, you, if that's what is in mind here, uh, it simply says, God dwelt in the middle of his people and loved to have them all, all around him. Uh, if that's what these four descriptions are all about, maybe that's what it is. They're there. They'll remind us God loves his people around him. It's just the way Israel encamped around the physical representation, the Shekinah of glory of God when he was on here. But those are four different uh, pictures or, or points of view. Very difficult to kind of uh, nail that one down. But either way, incredible beings that are there to do God's bidding. And apparently the worship leaders uh, in heaven, we'll look at that in just a moment. Uh, they they are all also proclaiming God's holiness. Uh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God uh, Almighty. As they do, as we see in Isaiah. You remember the opening chapter of Isaiah, his friend, uh, King Uzziah had died. And, uh, and Isaiah is mourning him. And then it says, and then he had this vision. He was high and lifted up. And then he he has this vision in heaven. He sees the same script, uh, creatures described the same way, and they're seeing the same thing. Uh, when the Bible repeats itself, it's usually for a reason. God's not just holy. He's holy, holy, holy. Now, some would say he's not really talking about the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are one, and they are, they are holy, or else it's being repeated for uh, effect and impact, but again, giving glory to God. And that takes us to our fourth point, which is the activity of worship is uh, central to the throne, verses 9 to 11. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were, were created. And uh, certainly the, we've, got, uh, we've already learned this song, which is probably a good idea, as much as you could learn before you get there. And as I said many times, the study of the book of Revelation will help us uh, because when we get to heaven, you'll, you'll know where everything's at. People will be coming up to you, what's that? And you'll say, that's God the Father's throne. What are you, some kind of idiot? You never studied chapter 4 of Revelation? You'll be a puka shell tour guide in heaven if you, if you stay with this, uh, uh, with this study here. But uh, we already sing the song of verse 11. And uh, first we note that the 24 elders fall down and worship before the throne. And this is uh, in response to the angels who have already led out in worship. And now there's a response. And that's why we say they seem to be the worship leaders in heaven. And then very interesting, the elders cast their crowns uh, before the throne. We've already talked a little bit about the idea that in the New Testament, there's a mention of several crowns that are, that are given. Paul says to Timothy in one of the last uh, things that he pins, 
uh, is that uh, there'll be a crown of righteousness for all those who love his appearing. So if you're, you're looking forward to the rapture, you're looking forward uh, to, uh, to being with the Lord forever. And that's one of the focal points of, uh, of your life and, uh, and your, your, your plans and how you uh, kind of direct things uh, in your life and speak to others about how great it's going to be to be with the Lord forever. You love his appearing. There'll be a crown of righteousness for you. Now, there's a, there's a martyr's crown. There's an elder's crown. There's several crowns that are mentioned and, uh, uh, but here they are, they're in heaven. Worship begins before this throne that we've just described and God the Father there. Uh, their immediate response, and it means they just kind of don't like, okay, I think it's probably a good time to worship the Lord. They don't like get on a knee. Is there a little kneeler here or something? Uh, they're prostate. It's, it's this, prostate, uh, on the, on the, with their face on the ground before the throne. And they are they are casting their, their crowns. Now, it's very interesting because uh, it's in a, a, a tense in the Greek that says it's, uh, it's continuous. Uh, it seems like a, well, you, how many of you got? You know, I mean, you, uh, so it's not that they're, like, give me another crown. I'm going to cast that baby down here. It's, it's the, I think there's a, tri- an, an, in a, sense, a description to try to say what happens when this worship begins and by the way, this is us, right? The 24 elders are, are representative of us, the church age believers. What will be our response? You know, like that song, I can only imagine. You know, what, what will it be like, you know, when, when I'm there? This is what it will be like. This is what it will be like. I love the song uh, because it kind of, you know, it's a great song. But this is actually what you and I will do. These incredible beings, these very powerful angels that appear to be the worship leaders in heaven, as we're trying to take take in what we're seeing uh, on the throne of God, and it's very loud in the peals of thunder, there's a sense of judgment, there's all about God's faithfulness, his love, and uh, and uh, his justice, you know, uh, is, is all, we're all caught up in that, and as they begin to worship, then you and I, the church age believers, we're prostate and we're casting our crowns, but it's a continuous action. Uh, and I think it's just meant to try to somehow, John with words is trying to describe something uh, that's going on here. Uh, the idea of the casting of the crown is that you are so worthy and I am so unworthy. You've given me this, but I do not deserve this. I give it back to you. Is that, is that, is that pretty clear? I mean, God basically saves us and he gives us gifts and he gives us the power of his spirit and he gives us all these things so we can serve him and it's all what he does in and through us and then he says good job here's a reward <laughs> i don't think i really did anything but no here's good job here's here's your reward you probably do that with your kids some sometime eat the rest of that chocolate cake hey way to go you know i'm gonna give you a second piece now now only dads do that uh, but uh, it, it, it's like he helps us do what we'd be wanting to do anyway and then once we've done it by his strength and his power and his grace then he rewards us for us and there's a sense again it's a continuous action we begin to worship the lord there's a real there's a realization that i really don't deserve this i really shouldn't have this and it was only by God's grace and his mercy, anything that we've ever thought, that we've ever accomplished in Jesus' name, we're going to realize it was all God. It was all what he did. And we're just going to say, I am so unworthy and you are so worthy. And apparently that's a continual state of mind is the way I read this, is you get this action that seems like it should be a one-time event, but it's actually described as, as a continuous action. The third thing is the 24 elders proclaim God's worthiness. Now it's verbal, not just in what they're doing or being prostrate before him. His glory, his honor, and his power. And then we get, again, the word holy uh, being mentioned three, three times. Certainly God is holy in two ways. He's separate from all that he created. Uh, Unlike what the, the Buddhist or the New Agers or others might say, uh, God is not in, in a sense, God is not the tree and God is not the stone and God is not, God is holy. He is completely separate from his creation. He created it, but he is completely separate from it. He is holy. He's completely different from it. 
We might look at creation and the, and the, scars, the stars you know, describe his majesty and power and, and attributes of God. But God is not the stars. God, God is holy. He's completely different from creation. And it also, of course, means he's without sin. I mean, everything in this earth is fallen, including creation uh, as well as ourselves. Uh, and God is holy. He's completely separate. He is transcendent, we say, uh, by his own moral purity. And then the fourth thing, the 24 elders pro proclaim God. Notice as the creator uh, of all things. God the Father is worthy of praise because of two basic things. It was his power that created all things. It was his purpose that brought everything into existence. By his power, he spoke creation into existence. And, uh, and at the same time, he did that for his own purpose and created you and I for his own purposes as well. Saved you and I for his own purposes as well. And, uh, and that's going to be something that you and I proclaim in heaven apparently a great deal of the time that we're there. Again, this is all meant to, John lets us see this. God brings him through an open door so we can see all this so it will impact our lives because there are times when our lives can be frustrating and we can't quite put the pieces together and it's easy to get into and why did God allow this, you know, and that? Um, and, and this is to help us see that uh, we're not really living for this life and God is holy and separate and he, his ways are higher than our ways. And, uh, and we really have no ability to, to comprehend always his purposes for the way things uh, happen in our lives. In terms of our goals, our, our objectives, what we're really accomplishing with our life, um, I think we want to be able to look and, and know that we're going to be with the Lord for all eternity in a sense. A we need a reminder of these things so that we'll constantly, and again, when, when they're prostate before the Lord, it's certainly a symbol of their, their submission. Right? Nobody laying on his face before somebody else saying, I'm doing this, but I'm really the one in charge here. You know, nobody's, nobody's doing that. It, it all becomes very, uh, very obvious. I just think there's going to be, you know, I know that, you know, there's that passage in, uh, that talks about, um, I think it's in 617 about the tribulation saints. You know, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching wind. Uh, and the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to streams of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Somebody says there's not going to be any crying in, or weeping in heaven, but apparently there is. And, of course, these are the ones that have been martyred for their faith, gone through horrendous things. But I think there's going to be, not long, but I think there potentially could be a sense of regret. I've seen people in this life, at the end of their life, have a real sense of regret. Because there's a realization that they're about ready to enter eternity. And they kind of wish they had got that eternal perspective uh, a little sooner uh, in life. And I think John's trying to help us uh, with, with that. In terms of what we learn from the elders who represent the church or us in heaven. Well, again, as I said, they submit, they bow down, they cast their crowns. In other words, they give all the credit to the Lord. They, give, they take no credit for them uh, themselves. Uh, they display a reverence for God the Father as well as a love for him. And they keep saying glory, honor, and power uh, be his forever and ever. So uh, incredible view through an open door that John has. And people speculate, was it a vision or did he really go there? I think he really went there. That's the language that we will see throughout there. He says, and you showed me this and you showed me this and I was shown this. And uh, how God did that. I have no idea how God did that. Uh, is it possible for God to pull some guy and pull him up out of the time-space continuum and let him see something of uh, eternity? Uh, certainly. And, we, uh, and um, uh, the other thing that's interesting is to kind of look at Ezekiel, what he's able to see, look at Isaiah, what he's able to see, take John's vision and, and see that you begin to get a, a fuller picture that God allows us to see heaven in, in, in a little a little slice in terms of his throne room uh, in particular. And uh, I think it's all meant to help uh, us and make us long for heaven to, to be with the Lord, to give us a little glimpse of what awaits us as church-age believers in the future 
And I think God is also trying to make it very clear that for you and I, this is where we are as the Great Tribulation begins. And, um, and so as we study about it, it's, it's not to make us fearful of our future, but it is to make us, I think, very concerned about the future of others. As, uh, as Daryl mentioned uh, at, the, at the conference in one of his uh, messages that uh, I guess I knew it, I just never thought about it. During the Great Tribulation, we'll get to that point, all the islands are wiped out. That, that means everybody you know that lives in the Hawaiian Islands will all be killed during the Tribulation unless they come to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's a pretty heavy thing, realization. If you add to that, and the, the, hour, the sand through the hourglass is, is going pretty quick. Uh, here as we look at the events of uh, what we call the things that are going to lead up to the, uh, the rapture of the church and then what will come after that in terms of the great tribulation. The blood that was spent, the hope